afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sinjai Tell. I'm here to present um, this talk on the power of hybrid and fusion imaging metrics in future PAC systems, a case study into white matter hyperintensity penumbra using flare and diffusion MR. And uh, my talk really tries to address um, how um, hybrid metrics are important uh, do have a role and a place in uh, clinical use, um, especially when you're in, um, integrating different MR modalities in identifying areas of white matter damage. So a little bit of background here. Um, we talked a little bit about diffusion MR in the last uh, talk and we'll come back to that, but one of the major modalities that we look used to look at white matter damage is uh, a certain uh, pulse sequence called fluid attenuated inversion recovery. The idea behind uh, this pulse sequence is that uh, if you time the inversion pulse perfectly at the right time, you can actually nullify all the water signal um, from the image. So in this case, uh, by doing that, you can see um, that the lesion here actually shows up much better than the standard T2 weighted image. And um, the flare sequence is what we use to identify uh, white matter hyperintensities. And white matter hyperintensities is exactly what the name uh, implies. They're hyperintense, they mean very bright regions within the white matter of the brain. And uh, these are typical for subjects that uh, have dementia or are developing dementia and uh, or Alzheimer's disease. And uh, neurologists commonly use uh, white matter hyperintensity load or the amount of white matter hyperintensity in the brain as an indicator of uh, disease progression. But uh, I hope to um, show you in this talk that maybe the uh, not only can we calculate white matter hyperintensity load, that we can do a little bit better than that, um, that we can find regions in the brain where uh, we can see the white matter hyperintensity developing, and that will require a, a number of imaging modalities. So what is the white matter hyperintensity uh, penumbra? And uh, Mallard et al. described it very poignantly in 2011 as uh, white matter hyperintensity may represent the foci of more widespread and subtle white matter changes rather than a distinct, sharply delineated anatomical anomaly. So those white spots were very sharply delineated. But uh, what uh, Mallard et al. And, and our group really um, believe is that uh, the, the damage is probably goes beyond that very bright region and that there might be damage outside of that region as well. And Mallard all had this very nice diagram that they showed that the core region area is where it's very, the flare image is very, very bright. But beyond the flare brightness region, um, there might be area just outside of it that they refer as the penumbra. And in these cases, um, there might actually be uh, a decrease in the flare value, but there still might be damage occurring. And they believe the, the way to look at this penumbra is to look at white matter hyperintensity in this region. And um, they looked, they were able to look at white matter integrity um, through FA value as an indication of that. And they then calculated a neighborhood white matter injury score that is a weighted um, version of uh, using both of these matrices, as well as the proximity to the core of the injury. So. Um, we wanted to do something similar, and so we uh, took flare images. Here's a flare image, and we um, automatically and objectively uh, segmented out the white matter hyperintensity regions. And how did we do that? Um, we did, used a simple histogram method. Um, so this is uh, the flare sequence that we have as a three-dimensional sequence. So we modeled the whole, the, the histogram of the entire imaging volume as um, two Gaussian distributions here and here. And the latter distribution, anything higher than two standard deviations above uh, the mean of this second Gaussian, 
we mark those as possible uh, white matter hyphen intense uh, voxels. Uh, furthermore, we also try to decrease our sensitivity to noise by uh, setting a neighborhood th threshold. So in order for it to be labeled a white matter hyper intense voxel, it must be uh, a, the cluster size uh, neighborhood must be greater than at least five voxels. And that allows us to automatically um, indicate which voxels are actually white matter hyper intensities. So for those of you who missed my talk earlier, um, I talked a little bit about diffusion sensor imaging and what diffusion means. Um, diffusion is the free moving of water molecules. And uh, in the brain, because of the axons, this diffusion uh, movement is actually restricted. And we can measure the uh, amount of restriction of, this, uh, of the water molecules by modeling the diffusion profile. And the thought is that if there is actually leakage or damage with the axon, then the um, diffusion profile should change in the direction that's perpendicular to where the axons are going. So in diffusion tensor imaging, we have a diffusion profile and we model that diffusion profile as a rank two tensor or ellipsoid. And in regions where it's um, where the, where the tracks we believe are intact, um, we believe that the shape of the tensor is like a long football, it's very anisotropic. And in regions such as the, um, the ventricles where it's free flowing, it's very isotropic. But as damage occurs, uh, the hypothesis is that, uh, the, and the idea is that the, uh, the amount of anisotropy decreases and becomes more and more isotropic as the uh, axon surrounding the um, water molecules actually start breaking down. And to summarize these characteristics, we use two um, sort of very commonly used one-dimensional metrics. One is called fractional anisotropy. It is basically uh, measures the sharpness of the football. And as you can see here, it's between zero and one and is normalized to the actual uh, length of, and the size of the football. MD, however, is not normalized, and it, MD stands for mean diffusivity, and it just is a pure size, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 divided by 3, so it really is the size of this diffusion profile. So here is what happens. This is one slice of the brain where we calculate the uh, fractional and isotropy metric. Uh, that I've shown before, and you can see here uh, all the white matter tracks and the white matter regions are extremely bright. So now going back to the white matter hyperintensities, we decided that if you can see here, the um, you can't really see where the flare uh, images are extremely hyper bright. It's not non-obvious in the FA image. And this is an FA image of the exact same subject. So we want to see what is actually going on within the diffusion um, tensor images when uh, there is a white matter hyperintense region. So we decided to do this using um, some histogram analysis. So on the left, you can see for the same subject, all the white matter voxels are plotted in the histogram. And um, here's the MD values, and here's an FA values, and then we plotted then plotted the MD values of voxels within the white matter hyperintensity. And also the FA values that are within the white matter hyperintensity. And you can actually see that these two populations are actually not a uniform subsampling of the white matter, um, of all the white matter. So this is a slightly different population, as you can see here. So in, in this sense, we can see that this is not just a, a smaller numbers of sampling of the overall white matter um, tissue of the brain. And in fact, if you look closely in order for this white, this subset of white matter MD values to, uh, to be part of this, this is actually 
uh, I would say a higher MD value subset of the overall uh, population of voxels. And similar with the FA values, this is an increased FA value population of the overall um, FA values of the brain. So this is relatively inconclusive. So we have this one very high white matter hypertense load subject, and we decide to look at some low ones and some high ones. And we really believe that um, that the amount of white hyperintensity load may affect um, the diffusion characteristics in, in, in the histograms. So here are two subjects with low white matter hyperintensity load and two subjects with high white matter hyperintensity load. So you can imagine that these subjects with high white matter hyperintensity load is a little bit further along in the disease process. So they have areas that are developing disease as well as areas that are um, have already been damaged. Whereas the low white matter hypertension load, we would expect that a lot of the regions within uh, the histograms within the white matter hyperintensity might just be regions that um, started to develop damage. And um, to indicate that they are comparable, if you look at the entire white matter um, histogram for MD values, they look similar regardless of the uh, white matter hyperintensity load. Similarly with the MD values, they look similar, very, very similar across all four subjects. Um, similar with FA values, they look similar, very, very similar in the distribution. But when you start looking at the MD values, you can see that the MD values for the low white matter hyperintensity loads actually look quite similar. And the ones for the high ones look quite similar. So if you take a closer look at this, you can see that, um, in fact, again, that, that uh, when going from low white matter hyperintensity load to high white matter hyperintensity load, you can think of it as a progression of disease, these are two subjects to these two subjects, that it's not a simple um, addition of the same um, distribution here to get this. They're not quite equivalent. And in fact, to get from here to here and here to here, you really have to add um, more low mean diffusive voxels. And low MD voxels um, are often characterized as voxels that have low, uh, low amounts of inflammation and therefore could be um, scar or damaged tissue. So here's uh, another figure from uh, Mallard's paper and what they did was they actually um, as a representation of their penumbra diagram and they looked uh, and calculated this neighborhood weighted um, injury score which is the you can see here closest to the white matter hyperintensity region it's uh, the blue is the highest and then as you get further away from it it becomes red and the value decreases and they tried to look at the FA values around these white matter hyperintensity regions and interestingly it has increased uh, which is counterintuitive in terms of what we know about FA changes. We believe that decreases in FA changes actually indicate damage. Um, and so um, that is something to look for, although it is inconclusive because um, we don't know how far this um, FA value increase actually occurs, and we're still unsure from this map where the damage is actually occurring. Um, I don't believe that the only just this FA value region here is really damage occurring. As you can see from my our histograms, the actual um, FA values within the white matter hyperintensity intense region is actually changing as well, and I, I don't think this represents it um, exactly. Uh, gives you the full story, and we really need some metrics that encapsulate more diffusion metrics as well as the flare values um, to be able to do that. So, in summary, um, I hope I've demonstrated that there's a need for uh, clinical need for hypermetrics that encode um, spatial proximity to white matter hyperintense regions. We know that that's a region where the damage is ongoing. Secondly, um, things that uh, encode not only diffusion metrics but also flare. Uh, and other um, MRI modality images. And we also, I hope, have shown through our 
our simple comparison of low white matter hyper intense um, subjects and high white matter intense subjects that prior knowledge of white matter injury effect on MI metrics is, is uh, necessary for us to be able to figure out exactly where the ongoing insults are going, uh, ongoing injury is, is, is occurring. Um, and last but not least, that uh, we require some sort of post-processing that combines a priori and a posteriori knowledge um, to general really truly meaningful hypermetrics. And I believe that the, the natural place for this post-processing to occur is um, in the PAC system. So that's it for my talk. I'd like to thank the various PIs that help, uh, help me in this work. Um, my sources of funding, um, uh, which is a uh, um, P grant in the National Institute of Aging with Dr. Chu, and uh, the NIBIB grant, R21 grant that our lab has with uh, Dr. Law and uh, Dr. Lapore as the co-PI. Thank you.